moderating today's which is uh, the mechanisms of te uh, Texas energy market demand side and energy efficiency. Uh, just to introduce SPEAR a little bit, we are one of six regional energy efficiency organizations in the country. Our territory spans both Texas and Oklahoma, and our program work is in policy, building codes, high performance buildings, and local governments. And our membership includes everyone from advocacy organizations and cities to ESCOs, manufacturers, trade associations, and utilities. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. We are offering CEUs today, so if you would like to earn your CEUs, you'll have to fill out a survey which is sent out at the conclusion of this discussion. Um, if you are calling in on a cell phone number and your panelist name or your attendee name is a number, please send me an email if you need to get the CEUs with your number and your name so we can make sure that you get, that, uh, get your credit that you need. We do have a couple upcoming events that I wanted to bring to your attention. Next week at this exact time, actually, Thursday, February 24th at 10 o'clock, I'll be hosting a second webinar entitled Nuts and Bolts of Texas Energy Efficiency Rule, where I'll be going over some of the uh, rules from the Public Utility Commission related to the energy efficiency chapter, uh, digging into the requirements, the history of it, and what some of the implications are. And then I'll turn it over to Allison Silverstein, who will talk about a potential, any potential considerations the PUC should look at uh, if they choose to open up the energy efficiency rule. The other event here is uh, March 2nd through the 4th, the Texas Energy Summit will be convened here in Austin, Texas. Actually, one of our panelists is the executive director of that event. Uh, I encourage all attendees to check out the website uh, for Texas Energy Summit. There are a number of really interesting and insightful panelists and, and discussions that are going to happen there. So I encourage everyone to check it out and register if you haven't already done so. Uh, we are sending out, like I said, a feedback survey. For those of you who are not seeking CEUs, we would still appreciate it if you would fill out the survey just so we can ensure that we're putting on programs that you all enjoy, if, if there are things that you'd like to see differently. That way we can make sure that we're gearing our, our content towards what you guys need to, need to hear and learn about. And then the last thing I just want to mention is a little housekeeping. I know everyone's been on a million of these webinars and panels before. Uh, we will be using the chat box function for the first probably 50 minutes. Um, so if you have any comments or questions, please utilize that chat box function and we'll try and answer any questions that we can, or we'll be sure to moderate it and pass it on to our panelists. Once we get to the last 10 minutes, we're going to do a Q&A session. Um, and that Q&A, we are going to uh, use that raise hand function, which again, I'm sure everyone's aware of, but um, I think that'll be a, a pretty good discussion in that part as well. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. Start with Doug Lewin is the president of Stoic Energy. Doug founded Stoic Energy in 2018, and he, before that, was led the government and regulatory affairs work for Clear Result, which is an energy efficiency program implementer. Doug uh, was also the founding executive director of SPEAR, so we're always happy to have Doug back here, and he also has worked with the Texas legislature uh, prior to his time with SPEAR. He is a nationally recognized expert in energy, uh, particularly the electric grid, renewable energy, energy efficiency, demand response, utility regulation, pollution reduction, and I'm sure many more things as well. Uh, and he's been a number, uh, featured on a number of newspaper articles and TV radio segments over the years. So we'd like to welcome Doug. Our second panelist is Chris Pash. He is the Director of Client Solutions at Clear Result, the Southern Region. He has over 10 years of experience in the energy industry, and he is currently responsible for implementation of multiple energy efficiency programs across a variety of electric utilities in Texas. Prior to working with Clear Result, he worked with, the, with Austin Energy overseeing federal compliance with the city's ARRA funded efficiency pro, uh, projects. And just a little bit about Clear Result, it's the single largest provider of energy solutions in North America. They offer energy consulting services to lower load requirements for utilities, reduce energy bills for end users and minimize environmental burdens on communities. Our final speaker and panelist is Andrew Robeson. Uh, he is a research analyst with the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute or TEPRI. Andrew received his master's in global policy studies from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. His primary concentrations are in energy and environmental policy issues, and in, both in, from a global perspective and a focus on Texas oil and gas industry. Prior to joining TEPRI, Andrew worked at the Texas Senate Research Center during the 87th legislative session. And during his undergraduate studies, uh, Andrew uh, had the opportunity to have multiple consultancies, both in Berlin, Germany, and the United States. So we welcome all three of our panelists. And I think we can go ahead and get started here. Let me stop sharing my screen. If I, if I can, hopefully. Hopefully you guys are not seeing my screen. 
we're still seeing your screen. Oh, there we go. So stop. that stop share button. There, there you is. go. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. I thought I clicked it and I didn't. Well, Doug, since you, uh, you helped me out there, I'm going to go ahead and start with you if that works. Uh, as many of our attendees are aware, uh, over the last year, and we're currently in the process of, uh, I wouldn't say celebrating, but recognizing that we are a year since Winter Storm Uri uh, last year, where millions of Texans had lost uh, power, water. They were dealing with cold, both inside and outside, extreme temperatures of their home, um, and also prepping for financial fallout from high energy bills over that time. So I wonder if you can maybe just walk us through a little bit of what exactly happened last year that kind of led to the blackouts and, and put us in the position that we were in um, during Winter Storm Uri. Yeah, thanks, Noah, and thanks so much for, for having me today. It is great to be uh, doing a Spear event, as you mentioned in, in my bio. Uh, very proud to have uh, spent four, almost five years as the executive director of Spear, and glad to see you guys doing so many great things. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'll, I'll just be, I'll try to be quick with this answer, um, because I think people, we've, we've talked about this a lot over the last year, and I definitely want to get to the, the, the topic here that, that we're here to talk about today, the demand side energy efficiency, but actually that is sort of part of the answer of how, you know, how did everything happen? How, how did we get to such a catastrophic failure of the grid and, and um, you know, over 700 deaths and uh, we don't even know how much damage, but somewhere uh, probably north of 100 billion, maybe as high as two or $300 billion. And I think you have to start with the, um, I don't want to say it wasn't a complete ignoring. There were some things done based on the 2011 event, right? There, there were there was a pretty serious blackout. Nothing like 2021, but a prolonged blackout that affected uh, somewhere right around a million folks in uh, 2011 during Super Bowl week. It was a very high-profile thing. Uh, FERC and NERC put out a, an extensive report at that time. The PUC commissioned its own report from. Uh, engineering firm called Quanta. The recommendations in both of those reports were completely ignored, but mostly ignored. And uh, that, so I think it's important to go back there. And the reason it's so important to go back to that is because we have another set of recommendations now from FERC and NERC, 28 of them. One of them is specifically about energy efficiency. Uh, another one is about getting better load forecasting because we don't understand, and for called us out on this specifically, we don't understand how inefficient heat is driving uh, our demand. And some of those recommendations are being ignored right now. They are not being followed through. Now, I want to be fair, uh, the agencies, the legislature and the agencies involved have, have been doing a lot of work, and there's, there's a lot that's been going on over the last year. And you can't do everything all at once. So I want to be fair. At the same time, we ignore those recommendations at our peril, and we really need to address those. So just really quickly, what caused the, the, the outages? Um, the biggest three causes, and you can go back and look at the NERC and FERC report to find this stuff there. NERC and FERC and the UC Energy Institute did a comprehensive report afterwards. The two biggest causes were gas supply, going offline, mostly because of freeze-offs or voluntary shut-ins. Uh, and that's gas supply, that's wellhead, it's gathering lines, compressor stations, all different parts of the infrastructure had problems. Um, we, we lost 85% of our gas supply a year ago. About half of that, a little bit more than half, was offline before there were any power outages. So gas supply itself is a problem and needs to, needs to be winterized. Power plants freezing up. You know, those are like 1A, 1B. You can argue about which was bigger, but they were. Those are the the top two reasons. But a but a third and very close behind those two, or or, or just sort of coincident with them, is demand. And the fact that we needed at least 77 gigawatts of demand because we have consistently underinvested in energy efficiency in our state. That is one of the main reasons why we had those outages, and one of the reasons we need to address it to make sure that we never have them again. Excellent. No, thank you. That's a, a very thorough analysis of what happened and kind of what, what's you know gone on over the last few years, decades for that matter, here in Texas. Uh, I want to turn to Andrew real quick before we kind of dig into what exactly happened uh, from a legislative or state agency standpoint. But Andrew, I was wondering from your perspective, you know, were these impacts felt universally uh, across Texas or were there populations that were hit harder? And, and were there reasons behind that, do you think, uh, that, that led to such catastrophic events? 
Yeah, um, well, it's pretty clear that there were there were a lot of universal impacts across the state um, from one perspective, you know, millions of Texans lost power, um, tons of families were without water, had their pipes burst, had property damage, had financial difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, people resulted to unsafe measures to keep themselves warm and to find uh, water to consume during the storm, such as like uh, using their oven to heat their home, which, as many of us know, is not the safest thing to do, especially thinking about carbon monoxide. Um, and there's debate about the, the figures, but, you know, upwards of 800 people uh, died as a result of the storm, depending on which estimate you look at, which is not something we ever want to have um, during an extreme weather event. But never, nevertheless, it's pretty clear that um, folks in underserved and under-resourced communities were the hardest hit. Um, from our own internal research at TEPRU, we found that low to moderate income uh, participants in a survey that we launched experienced higher instances of burst water pipes, damaged appliances, roof damage, and other property damage compared to their higher income counterparts. Um, other key factors really impacted how uh, low to moderate income families were able to weather the storm as well. Um, as many of us know, um, Many folks who kind of are in lower income brackets often live in older or less insulated or less energy efficiency, less energy efficient households um, and often lack strong that often lack strong building envelopes or even um, like robust heating systems. So a lot of people just didn't have a mechanism to keep themselves warm. Um, also, many households, particularly in the southern parts of the state, such as Houston, um, all already had existing property damage from other natural disasters, such as Hurricane Harvey. Um, and so this really made living conditions quite unbearable during um, the extreme cold weather event that we saw during winter storm Uri, but even um, maybe with like the most recent cold weather snap that we had in the past few months. Um, following the storm, um, we launched, again, we launched a survey and we found that 92% of low income survey respondents expressed a degree of concern about electricity bill affordability, which is also a pretty big component of how energy efficiency can play into um, other problems um, for households, particularly those in the lower income brackets. Um, a lot of families have, have still been unable to address the property damage that they incurred during winter storm Uri and continue to live with poor insulation and weatherization. And as we're inching into the warmer summer months, that's that continues to be a problem for many families. Yeah. And then lastly, um, as we'll probably touch on a bit later, um, there is a lot of debt that's been occurred, incurred since um, the storm and with the legislature's decision on um, repaying that debt, um, many families across the state will find that they have higher utility bills to come in the next few months, um, which is particularly difficult during this period of higher inflation. So um, as you can see, the, the balance is a little bit off on how different families were affected in the state. No, absolutely. Thanks for that. And Chris, I want to turn to you. Um, you know, if you if you were a Texas legislator and you saw a, a winter weather crisis like this and, um, and and millions of Texans affected, obviously that's something that's going to end up turning your legislative session on its head. And that's what we saw last year. I'm wondering if you could maybe just walk through uh, maybe at a high level, you know, uh, Andrew had mentioned uh, some of it as well, just some of the policy implication or policy decisions that have been made since February of last year to now. I know there's a whole range of them, but kind of the high level of, of the, the biggest and, and most, I guess, publicized ones that we know about. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I was watching some of those hearings and, you know, like everyone else, I'm sure, and a lot of people on the call, I'm just really interested to see, you know, not, not even what was said, but who was saying it, and, um, you know, obviously with anything like this, there was a lot of blame going around and, um, you know, I think when they started boiling it down, it was really interesting. Everyone had different opinions on, on how to solution this. And as, you know, as these bills were going through, you know, we were obviously following them, you know, from our standpoint, just because it was going to affect our work and a lot of our clients were going to be affected. So we wanted to, we wanted to stay abreast of what was going on. It seemed like a lot of the conversation just automatically went to the generation side of it. You can look at bills, you know, Senate Bill 3 and 2 and read those and, you know, almost every, everything's about, you know, the, anything on the generation side, you know, how, how the gas is going to be moving, the weatherization, um, you know, putting things in place to, to, to monitor that. And I think that's really important. And I, like, like Doug mentioned, that's, that's a really big part of it. But, you know, I, I think the demand side of it and the solutions that you could have on that side were kind of lost there. Unfortunately, I think a big problem is, you know, like when, you know, for, for peak load curtailment, you know, a lot of, a lot of the emphasis, you know, seems to be on summer, right? And traditionally, that's been the solution for Texas. That's where uh, the demand is. But, you know, what happens in the winter when something like this happens, you know? Um, we invest a lot of resources into those summer 
peak times and rightfully so, you know, from a, from a, you know, you know, traditional standpoint, that's where they land. But, you know, what happens when something like this goes and you can't, you can't curtail the same load that you can in the summer, you know, and you're basically mm-hmm. calling on residents to do that and they're trying to warm the house. Um, so, you know, I think, I think again, you know, the ledge did a really good job of making it a priority, um, you know, and I think that's two thumbs up for that. But I still think we got a lot of work to do on, you know, again, the generation size has got some work to do, but also too, how do we, how do we manage demand, right? So they're, mm-hmm. they're one and the same, right? You don't, you don't have to have all the generation problems if you don't have such a high peak or if you are able to move the demand around. Um, and equitably, like Andrew mentioned, you know, like, do you have things in place, i.e. programs to help, you know, reach these customers that really need it the most, you know, where, where are the dollars going and, you know, who's, who's, who's being impacted, not just so much like how much KW is off the grid, but who's, who's able to benefit from them, you know, it's yeah. kind of what we were looking at too. And, you know, it's really interesting with the, you know, again, with the rule opening out, I think the PUC might be addressing some of those, but um, from a legislative standpoint, it seems like a lot of emphasis was on, was on generation. And they, to me, and I think a lot of my colleagues, we'd like to see a little more emphasis on demand also kind of a more balanced approach. Thanks for that, Chris. And I do want to dig into that, but just before we do, I think it's important, you know, as Andrew alluded to, we did just go through a winter weather storm land in here in Texas. And I think it's important. And uh, Doug, I know you've, you've tweeted about it a couple of times, so I'll go to you on this. You know, is it fair with all of the legislation and some of the state agency work that's been done um, over the last year? And now that we've gone through a, a winter weather event, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, essentially mission accomplished. See, it's working. We're doing what we have to do. We're getting more uh, generation. We're getting more supply side. Is it fair to say that? Or there, is it still too soon? Or is there more work to do, do you think? Yeah, I think there's a real danger in um, having a false sense of security uh, from that last storm. That storm was, uh, and I can drop a link to the tweet so you can see this uh, graphically, but a, a researcher um, at uh, a professor at, at Rice University, James Doss Gollin, who did a great study after URI and showed that URI actually was not the most extreme storm on record. And from a temperature perspective, 1989 was worse. Uh, as well as 1895, so it was the third worst in recorded history. This last one that we had just this year was the seventh worst in the last 12 years. So this was this was not even in like base, basically in every other year kind of a storm. It got down to like you know 15 or so in Dallas, where you know it, across the state on average it was about 15 degrees warmer than last year, and it only lasted. 36 to 48 hours, nothing like the seven to 10 days of freezing statewide that we saw uh, back in Uri. So it is definitely not um, comparable. And while we got, you know, there's, I, I think the best analogy, and I'll just leave it at this, for any football fans out there, right? Like at the beginning of football season, every great football team, you know, uh, whatever plays like a like a one double a opponent in their first game this was a one double a opponent like we won there were no like rotating outages on the bulk power grid and that's great and you celebrate a victory like that but that victory does not tell you you're going to win the national championship this was a very weak opponent and we won cool great but that does not tell us what what's going to happen in in the next um you know uh challenges we we are going to face and in a and in a world where climate change is happening and happening at a more rapid pace and extreme weather events are getting worse look i i'm i'm feeling less and less comfortable with every report i see come out about what summers are going to be like we saw portland at 116 degrees last year god forbid we get something like that in texas and what would happen to our thermal power plants that rely on water you know the we're we're not ready for climate change and if anybody thinks that this very average mild winter storm uh <laughs> means that we are ready they 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 ought to rethink that so i guess switching gears a little bit here and i think really getting into the meat and potatoes of this discussion is focusing in you know anyone who's taken an economics 101 course knows there's supply and demand all three of you have hinted at or talked about a little bit the market equation and the focus on supply side, capacity side, um, generation. I would, I'm hoping we can dig in a little bit on what demand side really is. I, I mean, you've talked a little bit about energy efficiency. What does that look like to you, Doug, as far as demand response, energy efficiency? Um, and you know, and also to be fair, you know, the PUC has mentioned demand response in their phase one uh, market redesign. 
but there's not a lot of specifics there. So what do you see as far as demand, uh, demand side solutions? Yeah. And I always, I always want to be careful not to like give into negativity bias. It's a real thing. So let's, let's do say something positive here in the phase one um, memo that the PUC adopted. One of the things they did was ask ERCOT to identify barriers to virtual power plants. So let's, let's, in, a, let's, let's in, in the course of this hour, let's make sure we talk about what virtual power plants are, but, but it's basically harnessing lots of small um, demand flexibility, right? I think the best way to think about this is, is with the example of electric vehicles, right? We're, we're up to about 120,000 electric vehicles in the state. We're probably going to hit a million within three-ish years. Uh, if everybody charges their electric vehicles at six or seven in the evening, as peak demand is rising and as the sun is setting and our solar resources are starting to drop off, we're going to have problems on the system. Conversely, it, in a more positive sense, if we're able to have managed charging and those cars, only the ones that need to be charged because somebody's ready to go out that night or whatever are charging, we'll have enough power for that. And the rest of them are on an automated, nobody has to think about it. You plug it in and you just have a setting, like make it as cheap as possible to charge this thing up. And you wait till one, two, three in the morning, charge that battery up. It's full and ready to go in the morning. That's, that's demand flexibility, right? But Electric vehicles is one example. You've got electric hot water heaters and you've got pool pumps that, you know, even, even compressors on refrigerators, doesn't really matter when they run. There's a lot of flexibility in our buildings right now that we're not tapping into. Um, and I want to turn it over to the other speakers here at They Say, but I just, I just want to mention one thing in this context because demand flexibility and virtual power plants are great. But in that memo that the PUC had, the heading was demand response. And then underneath there, they had improved performance of energy efficiency. I want to be clear, these are very related things and they're complementary, but they're different and we need to go after both of them. And one thing we got, and I could drop this link in there uh, as well, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE, did a report a couple months ago, and they showed that you know, we could get a whole lot of savings. There's two things I would focus on particularly in there. And I looked this up because I said the other day, I was speaking somewhere and I, I said again, as I've said a lot, $800 million for eight gigawatts of reduction. And I just started doubting myself, like, God, am, I, am I adding this up right? That just seems too good to be true. All their work is in the appendix. All their numbers are shown. Their math is there. It's actually better than that. It's actually $730 million for 8.3 gigawatts. And that's from two things changing out inefficient heat and getting smart thermostats into homes. There is no other way we can get eight gigawatts for $700 million, nothing even close. And that 700 million can be spread over five years. It's one time you don't have to keep, hopefully we keep doing energy efficiency for a long time to come, but you actually could do a five-year program, measure its results and move on as opposed to some of the other changes that are in those PUC memos that will add up to by the PUC's own consultants estimates $2 billion every single year. Um, so anyway, so I would look at heat, I would look at thermostats um, as far as bringing demand down, and then also look at demand flexibility and bringing some of these different loads in that can respond to a signal uh, and move up and down based on how much power we have available or don't have available. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to bring Chris in as an implementer. I think you have a really uh, unique perspective on some of these programs and and what solutions or how they can be actual solutions. So what do you see as it relates to energy efficiency and reducing that total demand? Yeah, yeah, I just, I mean, Doug, Doug here on a lot of it, you know, it's, it's, it's using, it's, you know, it's core, it's using our equipment, you know, energy, you know, energy pulling equipment more efficiently, um, you know, helping customers do that. And then also shifting that load, right? You know, like um, a lot, of, you know, a big example I use when I talk, I talk to folks about the industry, I've gotten this, I've gotten this, you know, questioned a million times since the storm. It's like, you know, what happened and what's, what's, what's demand. And, you know, I like to, I like to use an example of, you know, like buying an automobile or a car, you know, if someone said, Hey, you can go buy a car. Um, you know, it can just be a regular car. You're going to go get your groceries every once in a while. Maybe commute to work. It doesn't have to go more than 80 you know, miles per hour. You can go out and get a pretty reasonable car. You can go get a camera report or whatever. Right now. What if I said, Hey, eight days out of the year, that thing's got to go 240 and go from zero to 60 in five seconds. Now you got to buy a Ferrari, right? Now you got to pay a whole bunch up front, maintain it, 
Um, you got to buy insurance on it and you have to have it just for those days or those times where you have to go really fast or it's got to outperform. That's kind of like our grid where, you know, we're, we're having to make these investments, you know, to make sure that everyone's power stays on. And, you know, I think you can leverage efficiency and you can leverage demand response in the right ways to, to cut that down, right, to lower everyone's costs. But, you know, what's interesting with the, with the winter event, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, the winter in the winter peak. And again, like I mentioned, it's kind of like, well, you know, we've had such a big focus on summer. I still think we need to. That's where the majority of our peak is. But, you know, what, you know, what we've been thinking about in our end is what, what programs can help, you know, both sides, right? So, like, again, the thermostats. You can cycle thermostats in summer peak. You can cycle thermostats in winter peak, right? You can help pre-cool or pre-heat homes um, strategically, right? So you're not just shutting people off, right? You can cycle in a certain amount where they can still stay warm. Um, and not and not have the big you know the big pull on the grid. So there's there's so many things that that you can look at from the efficiency side. But again, you know, balancing out generation efficiency, demand response. You know, how do you how do you have a balanced approach that helps everyone? Um, you know, equitably. And you know, again, focusing on the measures that are gonna are gonna be be beneficial on, on both sides, winter winter and summer. I think is gonna be a focus down moving forward. Absolutely. And let's let's bring in Andrew here, because, Andrew, you know, as you mentioned earlier, it, equity is obviously at the heart of this. And, and the people who have been impacted the most have felt the effects the, the harshest, you know, typically are the communities that lack efficiency and lack these, whether it's, you know, smart, you know, smart thermometers, heat pumps, what, what have you, any sort of efficiency measures or, or insulation. Can you maybe expand a little bit on, on what you see there, but also looking at, uh, you know, around whether it's the country or, or, or certain programs that you've seen that have been more effective at reaching those hard to reach uh, communities and, and customers, and, and if there are any, you know, potential case studies, for instance, around the country that we might be able to look to to help, you know, guide policy. Sure. Um, well, just to start off, you know, as Doug and Chris mentioned, there's there's really been a major underinvestment in energy efficiency, like writ large across the state. Um, we often find that the lowest income households are paying a disproportionately high percent of their income towards energy expenses, um, often due to low energy efficiency in, in households. And so from an obvious standpoint, there's a lot of untapped opportunity to, you know, upgrade outdated and inefficient appliances, um, which would really help to reduce energy use. Um, but of course, like things like heating and cooling equipment can only be as efficient as um, the building is uh, insulated and uh, the building envelope is sealed. So it's clear from uh, the experiences of Winter Storm Uri and even um, some of the most recent weather events um, that improving home building envelopes through insulation and weatherization would create benefits both in the form of energy efficiency and resiliency during uh, periods of extreme weather, um, but also help to really reduce electricity bills. Um, so, you know, especially when we're thinking about hot summer months, um, which tend to be longer in Texas, this really helps to re reduce the amount of energy needed to keep homes at a comfortable temperature and really help to reduce electricity bills for uh, low income households during potentially one of the most expensive times of the year. Um, it's important to remember that like, you know, some of these changes in costs may seem relatively low, but when we're speaking about lower income households, um, even small changes in electricity costs can really impact um, affordability, especially when folks are, um, you know, on a really tight budget. And so even, even small increases can increase the risk that someone might go delinquent on their electricity bills. Um, and of course, there's there's obviously already um, programs out there that are helping um, to improve weatherization and improve uh, building insulation, but they are they continue to be somewhat under resourced um, and really need to improve upon their um, community outreach and um, member retention. Um, a lot of people sort of become disillusioned with the process of engaging with these programs, um, especially when dealing with state and federal agencies, often because it takes a lot of effort or it takes a lot of time, or um, it can be difficult to find adequate resources in order to engage with them. So um, it's important that, you know, program administrators kind of take these challenges into account and really, um, you know, try and, uh, you know, utilize resources to ensure that the right people are, are being targeted and reached out to in order to um, benefit from existing programs. Um, but just sort of one thing to note, I'm, um, you know, it's while all of these efforts are important, we sort of have to remember um, what's caused a lot of the like 
underlying problems to begin with. Um, you know, it's it's a bit of a interesting challenge to um, you know target low income and underserved populations in particular, and and sort of frame that in the light of um, grid resilience when really um, a lot of the underlying problems um, kind of go hark back to you know discriminatory housing policy under uh, resourcing certain communities and um, other systemic inequalities that inequities that have like led to um, you know disparities in um, housing quality among different uh, racial ethnic and income groups across the state so I think that's something that we also need to remember and um, when we're um, allocating resources in the future we should take those factors into account more so so that's an uh, actually an excellent segue into kind of this last 15 minutes or so of our discussion. Um, you know, you talked a lot about a lot of the challenges that are currently, you know, in place. Uh, I think the first just general question here is, is who in your mind, and I'll, I'll open up to whoever would like to answer this one, but who has jurisdiction over some of these programs and whether it's reviewing them, expanding them, you know, changing them, however, who do you, I mean, is it, is it the PUC, Railroad Commission, is it, does, do they need legislative help? Can local municipalities or, or you know, utilities work on these themselves? How do you, how do you guys see that work playing out? I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, sure. You know, I, my, my opinion on it is it's, it's really, you know, this is a general answer, but it's, it's really everybody, you know? I think, you know, the commission ultimately, you know, has, has jurisdiction. You know, I think sometimes they look to the ledge to, sometimes they were waiting on this but I mean to me it's like with, with what happened it's like um, they have the jurisdiction to make changes and I think it's 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 everybody coming together right you know like with this you know, with the rulemaking or you know public comments or opportunities to engage you know I'd love to see all stakeholders come in and you know provide their feedback and opinions on, on why things should be and hopefully everybody could come to solutions you know you know utilities you know ratepayers uh, advocacy groups um, you know, come together and try to find an equitable solution to this. I think I think the winter storms proved that the the you know status quo doesn't work, and there needs to be a change. Everyone says there needs to be a change. Everyone I've talked to on all sides of the fence. I think it's just coming together and figuring out what that is. But you know, I think I think with everything, you know, like it's it's an opportunity. I think there's an opportunity to come up for everyone to be involved, for everyone's voices to be heard, and so hopefully that's all taken into account. But uh, you know, the time is now, and I think if, if, if we continue to punt on these things, we're just going to continue to have the same problem. It's going to be a dice roll for the next summer event, the next winter event. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just hope that whatever the solution is, it gets started pretty quick, just so we can, we can see it and have it in place. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd like to just, you know, kind of keep going with that. And I'd like to definitely have each of you, since you each have very uh, interesting and helpful uh, insights and perspectives here, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here. You guys have mentioned it a lot. Um, if you were talking to, or if you were a policymaker, what considerations would you try and take into account uh, as you start navigating the demand side of uh, the equation here with the Texas energy market? What should they focus on? What are some uh, potential, uh, you know, pitfalls or, or opportunities they should really hope focus in on? You know, is it equity? Is it, uh, you know, is it talking, you know, having more, empowering more local, you know, municipalities or what have you? What, what do you guys consider? Uh, potential uh, opportunities and, and considerations. And we'll start with Doug. Start with me. All right, cool. Um, so, first of all, I think if if you're if you're a policymaker, there are probably there there are three sort of main things you want to consider, or I would want to consider. I think a lot of our policymakers in Texas only consider the first two of them, but let's let's talk about the three reliability, affordability, and clean. Unfortunately, we don't focus enough on clean in Texas because a lot of policymakers still have not said out loud that climate change is happening and humans are causing it or that pollution causes people to die before their time or have asthma or you know all of those kinds of things. But I would argue that if you just care about one out of those three things, you need to do energy efficiency and demand side work because it increases reliability, it helps keep costs down, and it makes our grid less uh, polluting. It makes it less uh, you know, emission intensive. And so it, it actually solves all of those things. But even if you only care about one, if, you're, if your only concern is reliability and you just don't care about cost or clean, 
you should still be looking at the demand side because it's just it's just basic logic, right? If you if you if your demand is way up here, then you have to get that much supply to meet it plus a reserve, right? If your demand is here, then you need that much supply to get it plus a reserve. It's just it, this isn't that difficult, right? So so th that's something I would I would encourage folks to keep in mind. And then I just think on the let me talk a little bit more about the affordability piece. And, and this is probably a good segue into into Andrew, who knows so much more about this than I do. But I just want to cite a study. And again, I can drop this one in the chat. There was a study just a couple of weeks ago that surveyed around the country uh, how many people went without medicine or food in order to pay their energy bill last year. Nationally, that number was 28 percent, which is almost unfathomable and, and insanely high and the richest country in the world that 28% of our fellow Americans are having to decide between their medication, putting food on the table and staying warm in the winter or cool in the summer. In Texas, that number is 10% higher. 38% of Texans, nearly four out of 10, gave up medicine or food to pay their energy bills. And by the way, those bills are all going up because of the storm, because of rising gas prices, and because of the changes that the PUC is getting ready to put in place. Again, the load serving entity obligation um, favored by uh, at least one of the commissioners, their own consultant said would cost about a billion and a half a year. That flows down to Texas families and businesses. It makes our businesses less competitive. It acts as a tax on every business and family in the state. So energy efficiency, and I, I think this previews also the call you're gonna have in a week, because Allison Silverstein is is absolutely expert in this. How do you how do you compare the cost of energy efficiency to other things? We have this avoided cost calculation right now. They're about to procure a whole bunch of reserves, pay you know potentially billions of dollars a year to old fossil plants to sit there and not produce except in an emergency. How does energy efficiency stack up to that? We're going to need some of that reserves. I'm not arguing we shouldn't have any. But how much, how big is that slice of the pie? And could you bring it down if you were addressing the demand side? And I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. How much, we don't know because the PUC hasn't done those studies yet. Um, and as far as whose authority it is, I just want to make the point to everybody on the call in case they don't know this already, that in 2010, the PUC on its own authority and volition without a legislative uh, mandate or direction increased the energy efficiency programs. That happened in 2010. There is very recent precedent. This is well within the PUC's authority if they choose to use it. Thank you, Doug. We'll, we'll head over to Andrew. Yeah, um, thanks for that great segue, Doug. Um, you know, I think in, in many respects, energy efficiency is the path of least resistance. And, um, you know, it's always important to note that, like, energy efficiency measures tend to pay for themselves a lot of the time. And um, with respect to um, thinking about our energy future, reducing energy is a much easier path than figuring out alternative solutions um, to reducing the negative side effects of our current energy generation. Um, and with that being said, I think we're, we're seeing, we're in a period of time of rising energy costs, as Doug mentioned, that are, that's being caused by um, many different factors, but um, as the income gap disparity continues to grow between the highest in incomes and the lowest incomes, those in the lowest income brackets are continue are going to continue to feel a disproportionately high percent of uh, the impact of these rising energy costs. You know, in um, we we consider um, people to have a high energy burden when their energy costs are above six percent of their income and to be in energy poverty when it's above 10%. So we are seeing rising energy costs continuing to um, push people into those um, areas of high energy burden or energy poverty, particu particularly in um, the most underserved parts of the state, um, which tend to be concentrated in um, communities of color and disproportionately underserved areas of the state. Um, with that being said, I think we also need to touch on, um, to some degree, the split incentives that we find in, in different parts of the state, um, not only between renters and homeowners, but also um, in the competitive market and in um, the non-competitive market. So um, thinking about renters and homeowners, you know, we need, as, as um, home affordability continues to, you know, be out of reach for many people, um, a lot of people are sort of stuck renting and when, you um, 
landlords do not have the proper incentives to invest in energy efficient technologies such as mine, not pointing fingers, but um, you know, it, it really um, causes people to disproportionately pay more for energy just because um, there's not an incentive for uh, homeowners who rent out properties to invest in those technologies. So I think um, those, are, those are a few aspects that really need to be focused on when we're developing policy in the future. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Andrew. And Chris, bat and clean up here. You know, yeah, I'll just I'll just double down on the, uh, the stakeholders piece of this. I think everyone needs to be involved, right? You know, any kind of change that's coming down to, that would affect demand side. You know, anything from you know ratepayers, stakeholders, um, to you know they're going to have to bear the burden of any you know increase in bill ridership, and they have to understand what that means. You know, it's not just an increase on your bill; it's it's investment in um, you know policies and plans that will. Keep the lights on basically just like just like any kind of addition to generation side is going to trickle down to to rate pairs so does it, so does ee and i think you know i think you know big time um the utilities have to be involved and any solution needs to be equitable for them right you know they have a job to do um a big job and you know like especially in the case where they have goals and you know targets you know like they have it, it's got to it's got to be sized right for the territory and it's got to be something that's achievable and um, you know, everybody's got to be on board with it, really. So I think if you get if you get into a situation where on the policy side, you're focusing on, you know, one group's uh, needs and not the other, um, it's I don't think it's going to work out because, again, everyone's got to be on the same page. And everyone has to really understand what the end goal is, is to like 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 Doug said, like, you know, reliable power. That's, uh, you know, that's cheap and everyone can afford, it, right? That's that's kind of the, the main goals. I don't think any policymaker can break those bounds like that's not. You know, that's just that's that's what what's what you got to do. So, you know, those those are the um, those are the boundaries, and there's a lot of room in there to, to find a find an equitable solution. I think if if policy comes through and one group is really upset about it, or you know, like can't it can't be everyone has to understand it. everyone's not going to be completely happy with an outcome, but everyone has to be feel like they got something in you know something in the deal per se. And I think everyone's responsible for for voicing their opinion to make sure that's heard. Um, but yeah, I just really hope that people really come together and understand this is really important and, um, you know, really, really like work for a compromise. Cause in the, in the end of it, I don't think anybody on this call or anyone in the state wants power to go off and people to be, uh, negatively impacted like they were in the storm. It's, it's just the solution I think is where some of the arguments lie. So I just, I just hope everyone comes together and I hope from a policy standpoint, um, all these things are taken into consideration because for a, for, to me, for a solution to last, um, there has to be like buy-in, you know, on a, on a lot of it, it's not going to stick. So uh, that's my two cents. Absolutely. Well, uh, before we turn it over to Q&A, I just want to go ahead and say thank you to the panelists. You guys have really given us a lot to think about uh, over the last 45 minutes or so. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and open it up to Q&A to the audience. It looks like we've got almost 60 attendees. So if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, please use the raise your hand function or put it in our chat box. And, you know, I have one question. To, oh, never mind. We got a question here from Cyrus. Hey, um, this is a question I don't know a lot about. So maybe it's on Andrew, but um, uh, a lot of the advocacy that I'm involved in is more at, you know, PUC or COT. Um, but TDHCA has a lot of housing programs. Um, and they also oversee both the LIHEAP and the weatherization funding, or at least they have to come out with an annual program. Are there things we should be doing or advocating for at TDHCA that could in particular help working Texans uh, save energy, become more energy efficient? Um, is, is that an area we should be focusing more on as, as advocates? And I'm assuming you have some experience there, but if you don't, then you know, then say you don't. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I, I'm i not a huge expert on TDHCA, but one aspect I do um, have some interest in exploring is, um, you know, thinking about the low-income housing tax credit um, funding mechanism in, in Texas. And I believe, in, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe that every year they review um, the point allocation system for how they um, how affordable housing builders like can uh, 
receive points for different aspects of affordable housing uh, buildings. And so part of that can be um, going to TDHCA and sort of advocating for allocating more of those QAP points for those low income construction projects to be allocated towards energy efficiency measures. Um, of course, that sort of is in conflict with existing code and other like building requirements in different municipalities across the state. But I think uh, writ large, you can kind of ideally um, advocate for um, uh, those low income housing tax credit funds to be allocated towards projects that have a larger focus on energy efficiency. But again, I, I am not an expert in this, but that's sort of what I've been thinking about as of recently. Yeah, that, that's a good, I, I did try on one occasion to do that and got a, a little bit, but I think it's, I think it is a good area to focus on. Thank you, Cyrus. You know, I've, I've got a, just a, a interesting question and that's really comes from a friend of mine when I told him I was putting this on. He has uh, in his home smart thermostats and he has gotten very concerned when um, the thermostat temperatures kind of changed on him with it seemingly changed on him. I'm, I can't say for sure what happened. Is there any concern, do you think, from anyone who wants to get into the whether it's, you know, privacy or freedom of, of how much they want to use or not use? You know, how do you rationalize that kind of, um, you know, I guess uniquely Texas in a lot of ways? Um, you know, freedom of, of your, your property, your things. How do you, how do you rationalize that? If that makes sense. I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah. That's, that's a big thing that comes up, especially in demand response where you, you literally have a utility coming in and affecting, you know, your thermostat and then everything's so connected now, you know, I think that the idea of like, you know, information transfer and privacy is, is huge. And it comes up all the time when we're designing programs. You know, I think, I think just like anything else, right? You know, I mean, you think about all the apps on your phone now and how much you're connected to social media and, you know, the prospect of information sharing and, you know, the T's, T's and C's you, you click on real quick that are like a million pages long from, you know, Facebook and Apple and everywhere else. Um, you know, you, it's, you really, the customers have to be aware of it. I think it's really important, you know, um, to put those T's and C's on and not just, I mean, what we like to do actually is like, you know, take the big highlighted portions of them when you're rolling a demand response program. Like I'd say, here's, here's what you're signing up for. Here's what this means, right? And here's the benefit. Because I think if customers really understand what they're doing, you're getting on, you know, you're getting on this program to help curtail load and really help them understand why they're doing it for a larger benefit. It's not just, I mean, it's to, you know, it's to get the incentive and that's great individually, but you're really helping out, you know, the overall energy burden of the state or the territory. So, you know, they have to understand that. And they also have to understand, yes, you're enrolling for a program that, you know, will cycle your thermostat or will, you know, lower it, right? And that has to be understood. But, um, you know, a lot of what we like to do when we design programs like this is, you know, like a, with these, it's like really important to have a call center, have a lot of good information. So if someone does have a question about that, they can call them and we can help them understand what that is. And, you know, some people get enrolled in those programs and they want to say, you know, this isn't something I don't, I actually don't like, I'm not comfortable with it anymore. And they opt out of it. And that's okay too, because I think, you know, the majority of people understand, but you just have to make sure that when you're making a program offering, you have to really let the customer know what they're they're getting involved with and what the benefits are, and they can make the decision for themselves. Thanks yeah, I'll just I just want to add to that real quick because I think this is it's a great question, though, and I'm glad you asked it because this the, the demand flexibility I was talking about earlier doesn't work unless customers understand what's going to be cycled and when or don't feel it right so like if you're if, if you're moving a thermostat within a degree or two it's generally not detectable you know by humans or or household pets or anything like that if you're moving it three four or five degrees people are going to notice and so you've got to you got to pay people for that first of all and they've got to understand how much they're going to be moved and how much they're going to get paid and then they get to decide this is this is, and they get to control, right? There, there has to be, whether it's an app or whatever, where somebody can push a button and say, I'm out today. Um, you know, I'm, have, I'm having a party or my elderly, you know, my grandma's visiting, I'm out. And, and, and then you understand that then you're not getting paid there. There was a really important thing said in one of the workshops at the PUC early on, they did a one day session on residential demand response. They haven't done anything to advance residential demand response, but they at least, thought about it for for a day and that and that is important i don't mean that that sounds really i'm sorry it sounded too dismissive i'm glad they spent the day on it i'd like to see some actions coming from it that we haven't seen yet but one of the things that was said there one of the experts that was speaking said 
there is an in there is an uh, inelasticity of of uh, demand. In other words, like residential consumers, you know, it's like the the price of getting them to reduce is just infinite. People on the residential side just will not move, and that is just not true. There is tons of data out there, programs run by Clear Result and tons of other companies. There's retailers in the state, some of the, the newer ones, the Ohm Connects, the Octopus Energy, so on and so forth, that are doing these kinds of programs. And customers very much want to be part of it because it helps them control their costs. It gives them more control over those appliances within their home. And they understand that they're helping the reliability of the grid. But that really requires a laser focus on customer service and pleasing the customer. And if you don't do that, it's just like in any other thing related to marketing, you, you mess with one person and get it wrong, they're gonna tell everybody. And they rarely say when you get it right. So you've really gotta make sure that you're really putting the customer at the center of that and that they understand what's going on. And there have been cases where, where, where that hasn't happened. So we've gotta be real careful of that and mindful of that. Uh, the industry needs to be careful of that. Advocates need to be mindful of that. Regulators need to be mindful of that. But that is not an excuse for not doing it because customers want this. And every time it's offered to them, we see that. And I just want, last thing I'll say on this, I know I've been long-winded on this, but I, I really love the question. I think it's really important. These programs will always be voluntary. There is no, if, if anybody tells you, oh, they're going to take over your thermostat, sorry to cuss on a webinar, that's bullshit. They will never be mandatory. And, and you, if you don't participate and your neighbor does, that helps you, that keeps costs lower. So even if you want no part of these uh, incentives, you should be happy that your, your, your neighbors do want part of it. Absolutely. And it looks like we have a question from Tyler Wolf. Tyler? Yeah, thank you so much, Noah. Um, how much discussion is being taking place uh, at a state level or maybe even at a utility level to increase the, the, the generation at like a new construction opportunity. So if we incentivize at the ground level, a new construction building to have a solar or wind generation, especially in a state like Texas, where there's a hundred and however many people moving here every day, new businesses are moving their, their, their operations to Texas to headquarter. What kind of discussions are being talked about to incentivize some generation points on at the user sites, instead of having the, the utility have to shoulder that load, um, which then, you know, ultimately causes them to say, no, we're not going to build any more demand or generation because it's too expensive. Is there a way to incentivize the builder at the, at the ground roots to say, we want more generation out there, but let's share the cost. And then ultimately that will benefit the end user as well. This is such a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if it's all right. Um, so yeah, there absolutely are, are ways to do that, both on new construction. Uh, it can be you know, as simple as having a building energy code that requires solar ready and EV ready and things like that. There could absolutely be incentives from utilities or our programs, uh, I believe Clear Result runs some of them that are like new construction programs for Energy Star and you can get extra points on Energy Star for having solar. I don't know about storage yet, but that's probably coming as well. But I think also Tyler on the, existing buildings too. And again, I want to give some credit to the PUC here because they've been thinking about this. Commissioner McAdam said at one of the hearings or open meetings a couple months ago, we need to be thinking about folks that want to generate at their, at their own homes or businesses and how do they actually get compensated for the value they're bringing to the grid, especially with storage, but including with, with, with solar as well. So they're thinking about these things. Yes, there's ways to do it. Um, we're, we're so close to being out of time. We could follow off, up offline, Tyler. Maybe this is a, 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 like a future webinar Spear could do because it's actually a form of energy efficiency too when you're citing generation closer to where the power is used. And I think this is one of the key solutions to making sure we don't have outages is local power sources close to demand. Um, I, okay, I'll stop there because I could go on, but it's a great question and thanks for asking it. Well, and as uh, Doug just mentioned, we are getting fairly close to time. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen here so that you all can see. Uh, you should be seeing our panelists have graciously offered to uh, show their 
uh, share their contact information. You can reach out to them if you have any questions or follow up with them. I know all three of them have been very helpful for me. I'm actually relatively new in my role, so it's been very helpful to, to meet with you all and, and hear this discussion. And then the last thing I just wanted to share is uh, our, like, I, like we mentioned early on, we do have our Spear YouTube channel where you'll be able to find this uh, recording as well as dozens of other recordings that Spear has done with it from webinars on everything from building codes to energy efficiency and beyond. Um, and then we also have, if you go to our website, eepartnership.org, that's where we have a calendar of all of our upcoming events. Um, and at this point, I, I really just want to say thank you again to our panelists. Thank you all for attending as well. I hope you all got something out of this like I did. And uh, if that's all, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Noah. I appreciate you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris and Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye.